All right, so I want to welcome everyone back. This is going to be our screencast for Chapter 22. And what we're going to do is we're going to start talking about the area of science called evolution. And when you talk about evolution, we need to talk about a man by the name of Charles Darwin. And Charles Darwin was an incredibly important scientist. And what he had done is he came up with the concept of descent with modification. And when you talk about descent with modification, you're talking about basically the creation of new species over a long period of time that have been modified in some way based on the environment that they live in. As I had said, Charles Darwin was a really important scientist when it comes down to the idea of evolution. And again, his concept was descent with modification. In other words, as you look at the ancestors of these different organisms, you'll find that they've changed over a period of time, and again, based on their environment. So Charles Darwin had actually published a book called The Origin of Species. And what this book did for various different scientists that were out there during the mid-1850s it actually began to focus their attention on the huge amount of diversity of organisms that you would find on this planet. So Darwin himself actually perceived adaptation or change to the environment and the origin of new species as very closely related processes. And so what you notice over here on the right is you actually have four different types of finches. And actually Darwin is really famous when it comes down to looking at the various types of finches that you would find on the Galapagos Islands. And what he had noted is that all of the finches that you see over here on the right were actually descendants of the same common um, ground finch. But they had changed over a period of time based on the food that they actually consumed and the area that you would find them in um, on those Galapagos Islands. And so if you notice this finch right here, which has a very large beak, because the particular area that you find this finch in, the only type of food you would find were these very large, very tough seeds. And so only those birds that had very large beaks were able to crack these seeds and use them as food. While down here, if you notice in the lower right-hand corner, this is considered a woodpecker finch. And what's kind of neat about these finches is that if you notice, they can actually use a tool to um, take insects out of trees and use those as food. And so, of course, the beaks for these two birds are very different from each other. And so they've adapted based on the environment that they're found in. Now, another scientist that is really, really important to mention is a man by the name of Carolus Linnaeus. Now, he's really important because he took this type of information and he actually classified organisms. And the area of science that deals with the classification of organisms is called taxonomy. So he was taking some of the information that was provided by Darwin and some of his own observations and actually created groups of these organisms based on what they look like or maybe based on their behavior. Now, another area of science to look at is one called paleontology. And Cuvier was actually responsible for developing this area of science. And this is basically the study of various fossils. And this helped to lay the groundwork for Darwin's ideas that um, were centered around, again, the idea of descent with modification. Now, again, when you talk about Cuvier, you talk about the, um, the idea that you're going to look at fossils and how these fossils compare to each other over a long period of time. And so what Cuvier did is he actually looked at various layers or strata of sedimentary rock. And when you look at these different strata or layers of rock, you can determine that they actually occur in different areas of time on our planet. And of course, the fossils that you find in each of these different strata can be compared, and you can look and see how change has occurred for those particular fossils. So another important scientist to look at is a man by the name of Lamarck. And his ideas were a little bit different and actually kind of far-fetched when compared to Charles Darwin. In his hypothesis, what he had actually um, thought about was that animals would change or organisms would change over a period of time, but they would change based on whether or not they would use or disuse, not use, um, various body parts. And what this was called was the inheritance of what we would consider acquired characteristics. And so over here on the right, this is a really famous um, diagram of what Lamarck sort of hypothesized. And so if you notice, we have giraffes. And if you notice on the left-hand side, we have giraffes that basically are feeding on what we would consider low-growing shrubs. But over here on the right, this would be a giraffe that's actually trying to reach for these trees. In other words, trying to feed off the vegetation that's here. Well, the idea of use and disuse based on Lamarck was that if this particular giraffe continued to reach for these trees over a period of time, in other words, stretching its neck really, really far to try to reach this food, that any offspring that are produced by this giraffe would actually inherit the characteristic of a longer neck. And over many generations, eventually you would end up with a giraffe with a very long neck. 
Well, on the other hand, if you have a giraffe that's feeding on these low-level shrubs, their neck doesn't need to stretch quite as far, and so they would retain the short neck that you would find in this particular giraffe. And so their offspring that are produced um, would only have short necks. Now, obviously, this is not the way that it actually works. In other words, the idea of use and disuse um, isn't the way that characteristics are inherited. Now, Darwin had actually developed two main ideas when it came down to the origin species. His first one was, as we had said, the idea of descent with modification. And in Darwin's idea, this basically would explain life's unity and diversity. In other words, we mean unity um, basically referring to that all life is connected at some point. And then, of course, diversity meaning difference. And so if you notice over here on the right, we have something called a cladogram, sometimes called a phylogenetic tree. And if you notice, we have various different animals at different points along this phylogenetic tree. But if you notice, they're also all connected at some point. And so the unity piece that you would see here um, is easily recognizable. And if you notice, we have something called the ancient common ancestor for all these animals, and that's going to be located right here. Um, of course, the diversity piece is easy to recognize because, again, if you look at each of these different animals, they look somewhat different from each other. So the second idea that Darwin came up with was the idea of natural selection. In other words, that based on the environment itself, it would select those animals that were best adapted for that environment. And oftentimes we use the phrase survival of the fittest. Now what that means is that individuals with certain heritable adaptive characteristics are going to be the ones that survive, and those are going to be the ones that actually reproduce at a much higher rate than the other individuals in the population. And if this happens over a long period of time, and that leads you into the idea of speciation. And speciation basically means that if you have an environment that changes over a period of time, natural selection that we had talked about um, up here towards the top of the screen is going to result in adaptation to those new conditions, and that could possibly give rise to a new species. Now what's interesting about the idea of natural selection and adaptation is that we also can note that we have something called artificial selection. And artificial selection is basically something that we as humans have been um, participating in for a long period of time. Darwin actually had noted that humans have modified other species by selecting and breeding individuals with what we would consider desirable traits. And again, as I had said, this is called artificial selection. And so if you think about various animals like dogs and cats and maybe um, different types of um, food producing animals like cows or pigs or, or sheep or, or even different types of crops, we as humans, what we do is we look for those animals or plants that are the best producers and we artificially select the best that we would find in our population and we only use those to produce some um, future generations. And so that would be considered artificial selection. So again, it's very similar to natural selection, only we are controlling which organisms that we use. So Darwin then described four observations of nature. And from these, he actually drew two inferences. And we're going to look at those inferences in the next screen. So the four observations that Darwin had noted was members of a population often vary greatly in their traits. The second observation that he noted was that traits are inherited from parents to offspring. So in other words, thinking about the work of Gregor Mendel, the idea is that, again, we're going to pass those traits on to future generations. And then observation three was that all species are capable of producing more offspring than the environment can actually support. And what that's going to do is it's actually going to weed out those um, individuals that don't have the ability to survive in that particular environment. Then, of course, we have observation number four down here towards the bottom. Um, overproduction is going to lead to competition for food and other resources. So without the idea of competition, um, the whole idea of selecting those individuals, in other words, survival of the fittest, probably will not happen. Again, as I had mentioned, when it came down to um, the four observations that Darwin had mentioned, he did come up with um, two inferences based on his idea of descent with modification. So the first inference was that individuals whose inherited traits give them a higher probability of surviving and reproducing in that given environment do tend to leave more offspring than other individuals. Because again, you don't want that undesirable trait to be in the population. So you don't want to give those individuals the opportunity to reproduce. Inference number two was this unequal ability of individuals to survive and reproduce, again, is going to lead to the accumulation of those favorable traits in the population over many generations.
Now, another individual that was really important when it came down to um, the ideas that Charles Darwin had come up with was a man by the name of Thomas Malthus. And what he had done is he had actually noted the potential for the human population to actually increase faster than food supplies and other resources. So in other words, we have the ability to reproduce at a really rapid rate, but sometimes it actually outpaces the amount of food and other types of resources that we need to survive. And what that does is it actually causes competition between even us as humans in our population. So if some heritable traits are considered advantageous, these are going to accumulate in the population and this is going to increase the frequency of those individuals, again, with those adaptations. And so this process basically explains the match between organisms and the environment that we had mentioned at the very beginning of this video. Now, what we do need to talk about is something called a directional type of natural selection. And so a good way to sort of describe this is by looking at the evolution of drug-resistant HIV. So again, HIV is going to be that virus that causes the disease called AIDS. Now, over a long period of time, and again, this disease kind of came about um, in the late 70s, early 80s, there have been various different types of drugs that have been used to treat um, HIV. The problem with these drugs is that when you use these drugs over a long period of time, it tends to select for viruses that will be resistant to these drugs. And that's been a big problem in trying to find long-term treatments for this virus. Now, the reason it does that is because HIV actually uses the enzyme reverse transcriptase to actually make a DNA version of its own RNA genome. So the drug 3TC is actually designed to interfere and actually cause errors in the manufacture of that DNA from that virus. In other words, that DNA that was created through reverse transcriptase. The problem, as I had said, is that some individual um, HIV viruses, what they do is they have variety. And so that variation actually allows them to produce DNA without the errors. And so what happens is these viruses have a greater reproductive success in the um, infected individual. So the population of HIV viruses then can therefore develop resistance to the um, 3TC drug. So natural selection, again, does not create new traits, but what it's going to do is it's going to edit or it's going to select for traits that are already present in the population. Now, when you look at evolution or the whole idea of descent with modification, what we need to do is we need to look at the evidence that's going to be out there to help support this idea. And one piece of evidence that we had mentioned a little bit earlier in the video is the idea of fossil evidence. In other words, that kind of indicates that we do have change over a period of time. And as we had mentioned, the idea of paleontology um, basically helps us to do this. And so a paleontologist is going to be a person who's going to study fossils and look at the um, transitional forms of these different organisms. And so in this case, they're looking at um, a whale as our example. And so if you notice, down here towards the bottom, this is going to be our most recent whale ancestor. And so when you look at a whale and you look at the skeletal structure of this individual, this is what we would see for the most part today. But if you look and you, you kind of make comparisons of fossils over a long period of time, you can kind of see how their um, skeletal structure has changed. And so if you notice, this ancient ancestor up here was primarily terrestrial. But then if you notice this one right here, predominantly aquatic. In other words, predominantly means it could spend some time on land as well as some time in the water. And if you notice, if you look at the appendages, they still somewhat look leg-like. In other words, it gives them the ability to live on land. But then as the animal becomes fully aquatic, a lot of those appendages start to shorten up and start to change because they're no longer needed anymore. In other words, we no longer have a terrestrial type of animal. And then eventually, if you look at our most recent, um, again, whale ancestor, looking at the skeletal structure here, this would be your more typical whale. And again, a lot of the appendages have been modified. But if you look at the basic shape of that skeleton, they're very similar, and so that's a very strong indicator of relatedness among these different fossil remains that scientists have found. So another piece of evidence that we can look at is either anatomical or molecular homologies. Now, the word homology basically means similarity, and this is going to be similarity that results from common ancestry. So when we look at homologous structures, there's going to be some anatomical resemblances that actually represent the variations on a structural theme and that's going to be present in our common ancestor. So again, looking down here towards the bottom, what we're doing is we're making a comparison between a human, a cat, a whale, and a bat. And we're looking at the appendage for each of these four animals. Now what you'll notice is that they have color-coded the different bones found in these animals, basically indicating to you that 
whether it's a human, a cat, a whale, or a bat, all of these bones are still present in those animals. But obviously, they've been modified a bit to accommodate whatever environment that animal happens to live in. So over here on the left, you can see the names of each of these different um, bones. But the big part of this is I want you to look at how they've changed over a period of time. So if you notice, this is going to be a typical human arm. So you can see all the bones that are represented. And if you notice for a cat, you can see definitely see some changes in the phalanges. Um, if you look over here on the whale, you can definitely see a huge change in the phalanges. You can see the lengthening of this particular part of the bone structure. And then, of course, you can see quite a bit of shortening that occurred in the bones that you see up here. And then if you look over here at the bat, again, you can see the lengthening of the phalanges, but you can also see some lengthening of the metacarpals as well, and that's going to accommodate this particular organism's ability to be able to fly. A third area that we could look at when it comes down to basically providing us evidence of evolution or descent with modification is the idea that, again, organisms are related based on comparative embryology. Now, what this is going to do is it's going to reveal anatomical homologies, like we had talked about in the previous screen, that maybe aren't necessarily visible in the adult organism. So we're looking at the embryos of these different organisms. And so what they've done here is they've compared a chick embryo with a human embryo. And they have two different parts here. One of them is called pharyngeal pouches, and that's what you're going to notice right about here in the chick embryo. And over here in a human embryo, you can see these pharyngeal pouches right about here. The primary idea here is that we have two very different organisms, but early on in development, these particular structures are present in both. And so that's going to indicate to us that there is some sort of relatedness, again, between these two organisms. And again, if you notice down here, we have something called a postanal tail. So of course, we know that a chicken does have a tail, and so it's going to be retained in this particular animal. You can see it present in the embryo. But of course, in the human embryo, again, if you notice, even early on, we do have a postanal tail. But it is going to be absorbed by the embryo during development. And so, of course, humans typically don't have tails. But because it was actually present early on in development, we do consider that a piece of evidence that we would use that a human and a chicken are related at some point in that phylogenetic tree. Then we have structures called vestigial structures. And these vestigial structures are considered remnants of features that actually served maybe important functions in the organism's ancestors. And so looking at um, the picture that you see down here, these are just various different vestigial structures that are found in humans. And if you notice here, we have one called auricular muscles of the pinna. So this is going to be the ear. And if you notice, we have these muscles that are located right here. And these muscles are actually really important when it comes down to being able to move the ear. And if you notice, they're still present in some people. In fact, some people actually have some use of these muscles, and they can actually move their ears. Some of them can even move their ears independently. Um, the nictitating membrane that you see right here, so that area that you see right here in the corner of your eye, um, this is found actually in a large number of cats and dogs and even some fish. Um, this is still present in humans, but it's been much reduced. And so what we do is we take that vestigial structure and we sort of imply that there's some relatedness because the structure is still there, but we really don't need the structure anymore. And if you notice wisdom teeth, which a lot of us have had taken out, these are considered vestigial structures. So these would be considered our third molar. In other animals, these are used to grind um, various different types of food. But in our case, um, they're not really needed anymore. So then the whole idea of vestigial structures is why do they stick around if we're not using them? Well, the idea is that they really don't cause us any harm. And so for the most part, unless they're being detrimental to the population, they are going to stick around. Now, another good example of um, homologies, again, evidence at the molecular level, would be genes that are actually shared among organisms um, inherited from a common ancestor. And so looking at the DNA and, um, again, creating that DNA code or looking at that genome, if you can see similarities between different organisms, again, that's a really good indicator that those organisms were related at some point in time. So what you need to think about is all the different homologies that we look at, sometimes what they do is they talk about this as being sort of tree thinking. So the Darwinian concept of an evolutionary tree or a phylogenetic tree of life can often help us to explain the homologies that we're looking at. Evolutionary trees are basically simply hypotheses about the relationship among different groups. And again, this is just another example of what we would consider a phylogenetic tree, evolutionary tree, or a cladogram. And if you notice, we have these different characteristics that are listed right here. So we have a tetrapod limb, an amnion, we have feathers down here towards the bottom. 
this up here would be our ancient common ancestor. So in other words, this is the one that's actually considered the anchor point for all of these different organisms you see on the far right hand side. And the way that you would actually read a cladogram or the evolutionary tree would be um, basically if you look at um, tetrapod limbs, for example, when you look at where this is located here, what that indicates to you is that all of the organisms basically from this point on are going to have limbs. And if you notice, the one that you see up here, the lungfish, does not. Those that have the amnion at this point in the um, evolutionary tree include the mammals, the lizards, the snakes, crocodiles, ostriches, and of course these other birds, but it does not include the amphibians and it does not include the lungfish. Um, then of course down here at the bottom, you're going to notice that we have another characteristic of feathers, and again that's not going to be found in these organisms, but of course it would be found in the ostriches and various other birds. So evolutionary trees can be made using different types of data. Um, again, we can use anatomical evidence, we can use DNA sequencing data, so we can use lots of different forms of evidence to actually um, create what you see over here on the right. So sometimes what we do with evolution is we actually categorize evolution. And in this case, we're going to look at a form of evolution called convergent evolution. And convergent evolution is the evolution of similar or analogous features in very distantly related groups. And so these analogous traits actually will arise. In other words, these similar traits are going to arise when you have groups that are, well, geographically independent from each other. But what they do is they actually live in environments that are very similar. And the example that we have here is a sugar glider, and down here towards the bottom we have a flying squirrel. And if you notice, both of these have gained the ability um, to be able to glide, um, and a lot of that has come about based on the environment that they live in. And so if you notice, the environment for each of these organisms are basically separated by a great amount of distance. But again, the, the key here is the similarity in the environment. And again, remember that environment is going to dictate um, the way that an organism will actually um, evolve over that long period of time. So then we have an area called biogeography. And Darwin actually made quite a few observations of biogeography during his many travels in the um, early and mid-1850s. Biogeography is simply the geographic distribution of species. And this actually um, formed a very important part of his theory of evolution. So what we refer to when we look at biogeography is that um, many species are considered endemic species. In other words, when we use the word endemic, that means that they're found only in that part of the world and nowhere else. And so what Darwin had postulated was that these endemic species are often closely related to species on the nearest mainland or island. So another piece of evidence that really lends itself to Darwin's idea of these um, different species being very closely related was that um, if you think about it in terms of Earth's history, Earth's continents actually were formally united in a single large continent called Pangaea. And of course most of us know based on our middle school science is that Pangaea, in other words that large continent, has separated and it's separated by a process called continental drift. And so an understanding of continental movement and modern distribution of species is going to allow us somewhat to predict when and where different groups may evolve. All right, so that's going to finish up this screencast for Chapter 22, and as always, please make sure that you have completed your screencast study guide.